Welcome to the 37th series, everyone. This series, we welcome back Tracy Barnett to go over their new game, You Are the Dungeon, a solo journaling game. This is going to be something a little bit different than we're normally used to on this show, but it is an extremely wonderful series. It is such a good game, and I hope you check it out afterwards. For now, before we get to the episode, some announcements. First up, this Friday, as usual, every other Friday, is my A Tale of Twinkle and Awe campaign on twitch.chimera.games. You can check us out at 7.30 p.m. Central Time, where we are going to finish up a battle with a gigantic 300-foot-tall energy monster with the help of one of the player characters' friends from another dimension. It should be quite interesting to see how all of that plays out. Next up, I really want to take a moment to thank Victoria Rogers from The Broadsword, also on the One Shot Podcast Network. Uh, starting in, let's see, in a week or two, you'll be able to hear my work on the Broadswords podcast feed as I will be doing the dialogue editing for them uh, for the foreseeable future. And I am thoroughly excited to jump into this and to help Victoria out. I know Victoria will knock the special effects and the music out of the park, and I am so thankful to be able to set everything up for her to be absolutely amazing uh so thank you victoria if you're listening to this i very much appreciate this amazing opportunity so i don't have any other announcements i'm actually recording this without notes so it is a little more raw than usual and that should be okay for now sit back relax and enjoy the show everyone Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan, and this episode, my co-host Amelia and I are excited to welcome back Tracy Barnett, designer of the game we are covering today, You Are the Dungeon, a solo journaling game. Tracy, welcome back to Character Creation Cast. I'm really excited to do this again. Yeah. Yes, I'm really glad that uh, y'all were interested in having me on for this. Uh, this is a, a bit different than the the usual uh, fare for this podcast, mm-hmm. so I'm excited to see what we're gonna do because this yeah, is very different from what you this, had this last game, time game, too. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, there are, there are yes. connections. We'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> that's that, that's that's for the that's for the debrief episode. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's been a little while since we last had you on. So can you start by reintroducing yourself, telling people where they can find you, what you're working on? Uh, yeah. So my name is Tracy Barnett. I am a uh, non-binary uh, queer game designer, and I uh, the real answer is I'm working on getting as much freelance work lined up as I possibly can so I can be a stay at home parent come June Mm -hmm. because uh, I am going to be uh, non-binary dad vibes over (laughs) here. A brand new parent, like all shiny and everything. Nobody spit up on you yet. (laughs) Yes. Uh, No, not yet. Not yet. Uh, There there will be ample time for that to happen. Uh, but yeah, so uh, sometime in the next couple of months, I'll be transitioning to to being at home, uh, and I've got a freelance contract uh, that I'm working on. Uh, but in the meantime, I am making games. I have a Patreon to try and support all those efforts. Uh, I am the, uh, I guess, audio editor in residence for uh, the One Shot podcast. Uh, mm-hmm. I've been doing uh, all the episodes at One Shot over there since about last mm-hmm. August. Um. 
and I, that's going to be continuing uh into the future. Oh, that's and awesome. so, yeah, so I've got that work going on. Uh, I have my own podcast uh, called 15 Minutes of Fave, in which I sit down and very casually talk with a person about their favorite thing for 15 minutes. Uh, simple, easy, quick. Um, and I get to hear about a whole variety of, of stuff. Um, I'm a, I'm not a new stuff seeker outer most times. And so I really like uh, hearing what people's favorite things are because they're vastly different than. Well, than and very different stuff. from yeah. each so other. To, like I've been looking at the the things that people mm-hmm. have been talking about. It's like such a strange and wide variety of stuff that people are like, let me tell you about this thing. Yeah, definitely. I have made it very explicit to all my guests who come on that I don't want them to try and do something relatable, right? I want whatever their thing is, no matter how niche it is, that's what I want to hear about because that's where they're going to bring the most passion. And I have enough knowledge about little things scattered across all different subjects that I can at least hang yeah. in the conversation. Mm. Um, I but love the that though. Like I love when people find like their one thing that you're, they're like, like the rest of us are like, okay, I know an inch worth of stuff about, you know, most mm-hmm. things. And people are like, no, I've dug 25 feet deep and let me tell you. <laughs> like, it's so cool <laughs> yes, to listen exactly. to just like the passion people have and how excited they are about this mm-hmm. thing that you're like, but why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and it's also something that I can record the episodes pretty quickly. Um, if we go, we go mm-hmm. typically about thirty minutes when we record, and uh, patrons get the bonus episode, and that can be however long. I've made a few of those public so people can see what they're going to get. Like when I talked to JV Hampton Van Zant, we recorded well, we recorded for two and a half hours, <laughs> and then we decided we should like we were getting too in the weeds for mm-hmm. the recording, so we stopped the recording, and then we talked for another hour and a half Dang. following that. Wow. Um, yeah, just cause, um, that's the yeah. night we had that night. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, uh, it, it, it's a lot of fun, um, but I can generally produce it pretty quickly and that's going to, going to be necessary going forward is having things that I can, uh, do quick turnaround on because my time is going to become very segmented. Yeah. The there's conversational of ones I found like when I've done editing and done my own projects and stuff, those are the quick ones to do is like that back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. I, I look out for ums and uhs and by and large, uh, try and make sure our vocal levels match. And that's about mm-hmm. what it gets yeah. um, because everyone's recording yeah. pretty cleanly. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking about doing a game design uh, version of that, Ooh. by the way, where the premise is that it's it's Friday night and uh, the rest of your group didn't show up for game. So it's you and one other person. And in 15 minutes, we're going to like here are the, the goalposts for it, right? We need a premise. We need a pitch. We need resolution mechanic. And in 15 minutes, hmm. we make a game. And then I'll write the PDF up and that's what the patrons oh. get. That's nice. So we'll see. That I that one's still in the, that in the planning fun. stages. That would be fun, yeah. Uh, all Absolutely. kinds of projects. <laughs> Absolutely. But I have to I, say, like as somebody who's already a parent, <laughs> these are all great like things that you can get done during nap time. Like, like you have chosen that, wisely. That, yes. <laughs> I am really trying to because I know my time is going to be so constrained and so not even necessarily constrained, but it's going to be different, right? On my days off now, I have other than doing chores around the house or whatever, I have uninterrupted time where I can just sit down and, and do a thing. I'm going to be keeping windows open and like, okay, she's down right now. Uh, we're, or we're between feedings or whatever it is. And I need to get this thing done because capitalism says that I need to provide value in society or otherwise I don't yeah. get to exist. Well, yeah. So <laughs> it's a bummer. I got, yeah. I gotta keep making things. But I think yeah. too, that like, it, this is like way off of character creation, but like you yeah. want to, to, I was, um, I do. Yeah. that was a thing that like, honestly, making this podcast helped me kind of rediscover a lot. Um, But was that like, I missed doing those things for myself that were just for like Mm -hmm. my creative energy, because it was like, I was consumed by being a parent and my whole identity was Nate and Eleanor's mom. And it was like, I don't want that. I want to be Mm -hmm. Amelia as a person. Um, And so Mm -hmm. like having those kind of creative projects really mattered a lot to me. Yeah. And, and I mean, obviously if this isn't germane to uh, anyone listening, Ryan will, will be a deer and will cut all of this, but. <laughs> Ryan's um, also a parent. Ryan gets it. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, non-parenting it. listeners. Uh, some of the stuff that, that we've been reading, just sort of trying to make, 
we're not trying to like discover our parenting style now or anything like that, but we're trying to just sort of figure out what some of the things that may work are. And so one of the things that we're really interested in is setting firm boundaries, even with a tiny, Mm -hmm. tiny, tiny thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like there has to be space that is ours. There has to be time that is ours. And I know that that seems like an impossibility, but if you don't try to do it, you're never going to do it. This is so, I, like I have told friends and people think that I'm nuts for this. But like I am like I think every parent has like this is my hill to die on. And mine has been mm-hmm. sleep. Um, Like mm-hmm. like Nate was a terrible sleeper. But like for me, it's like this is bedtime. You go to bed at this time. Why? Because I'm ready for you mm-hmm. to go to bed at this time. But also like my children do not come in my room. Like lots of people like will have their kids sleep in their bed when they have a nightmare. And it's like, that's great if that works for you. That has never been like my room is my space. It is my sanctuary. It is sacred. You do not come in here. Um, They don't sleep in my bed. Mm -hmm. They don't like they'll come in here and find me if they need something or whatever. But like, like, no, this is my like firm boundaries. This is Amelia space. (laughs) You have the rest of the house, child. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and, and who knows what those things are practically going right. to end up being, but because and I think this is this is part of the of the game designer in me, like or game master in this in this case, right? This is like a lifelong running mm-hmm. of This a is game. a campaign friend. This is not there, a one shot. <laughs> it is, mm-hmm. exactly. But the way that I operate best is by loading myself up with the the knowledge that I need to have and the experiential data that I'm going to gain about how mm-hmm. all of this works and then improvising right from there, mm-hmm. right? Come from a firm place, say, these are the things that we know to be true about what we're going to be doing here. And everything else is jazz. Right. Like, <laughs> well, I think though that there's, there's something to be said for that. And like in the way that we play games too, of like, okay, here are all of the options of the way we can solve this problem. Let's try them out and we'll figure out which one works. And like, so much of life mm-hmm. is like that. And I think so much of parenting is like that. But I th- I think that you you are smart to say, like, you know, I need to figure out where those boundaries are and where I can, you know, like it'll take a little bit to figure out like which ones work and which ones don't. But I think that you're you're certainly mm-hmm. not wrong to like say we need to have some of those. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's it's the difference between someone saying, Tell me a story, and someone saying Tell me a story about the time that you were a scary dungeon that killed yes. all of the adventurers. <laughs> mm-hmm. yes. Speaking of oh, which. Very nice. <laughs> so we're, so we're going to transition from a uh, people parenting podcast yes. to character creation podcast. <laughs> well, see, here's the thing. Is that the, the people parenting podcast is for after you create those characters. <laughs> I mean, that's true. <laughs> oh, I don't need We already made some people, and now we got to figure out what to do about it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. Uh, Well, let's go ahead and get into this then, Uh, and we'll start by discussing what this game is all about. What's in a game? All right. Uh, So uh, what sort of uh, world are we playing in uh, for you and you are the dungeon? Uh, What what sort of setting? uh, What's what's the pitch for this game? Uh, So the pitch for the game is uh, you are the dungeon. You are a the the embodiment of uh, and a a grotesque, uh, dangerous, horrifying liminal space within which people delve for secrets and treasures and leave scarred by the experience. Perhaps they don't leave at all and they leave telling the story of you. You then uh, grow in size, you grow in power, you grow in renown and more adventurers come. So the assumed setting is uh, kind of like uh, Dungeon Crawl Classics Mm -hmm. OSR type grim fantasy sort of sort of jazz. Right. And that's where it all kind of ends. Like there's there's not as of yet, there's not a full realized setting with this. So when you read it, it's it's general fantasy type stuff like dark fantasy. Mm -hmm. But uh, I've already had one uh, one pair of people play this on a stream where they set it in a sci fi uh, context nice. and they did a derelict spaceship which is completely dope like i was really happy uh to to watch that stream because this game really can be adapted to 
fit whatever kind of story you want to tell as long as those same constraints of uh, evil dungeon ever expanding uh, are kept in place. Yeah. What kind of tools do we need to play this game? So you need the PDF uh, because that is where the text for how to do the things what you do in the game is found. Um, then you need, uh, there's a, there's a little paragraph that, uh, the, the interesting thing about this is, uh, the dungeon is the character and, and play is how you build the character and you don't ever stop unless you want to. <laughs> mm-hmm. so, and it's, it can be, um, asynchronous. Like you don't have to, to do this all in one shot. Like we're going to, you can take time and breaks and do this across, uh, a long time, but there's a paragraph called the necessaries. I'm just going to read it real quick. To be the dungeon, you will need the pages from this document, a deck of tarot cards, a single ten-sided die, and something to describe the happenings within your walls. You can have this experience digitally, but it is preferable to print these pages so you have a physical record of the broken souls who staggered from your depths. Nice. Yeah. Uh, And I do have my tarot deck at hand. This This is the third series in a row where I will be creating a villain. Ryan, it's interesting <laughs> that you frame the dungeon as villainous. Well, we'll it, let's we'll, unpack we'll, that. We'll, we'll talk about that when we <laughs> let's. Yeah, it's interest or antagonist would probably be that, a better word that's for a, it. That's a really good way to put it because part of the impetus of creating this in the way that I made it is that the idea of of dungeons in a classic Dungeons and Dragons context is that they are places to be explored with enemies to be killed and loot to be gathered, yes. right? And those are all very, very colonialist kind of gross ideas if you start unpacking them at all, yes. right? It's, it's the leftovers of, of someone else's civilization or someone else's uh, work and effort and potentially also something's home. Yes. And you are uh, heading in there and pillaging. Now, I am a uh, a white, uh, m- uh, masculine presenting non-binary person. I cannot and will not be the person to write an anti-colonialist game. It is literally impossible for me to do so as a white person. Mm. However, what I wanted to do is make a space where the door is open for those kinds of narratives. And that's what I think... Uh, this game accomplishes in part, nice. right? Like if it, if it makes you wonder about the motivations of the hapless fools who are going to wander down your corridors so much, the better Yeah, because it has the potential to get people thinking about the context of what it means to be an adventurer and what it means to be the space within which they adventure. And that's, that's cool. Absolutely. And that kind of starts diving into our next question of what kind of stories and themes is this game meant to explore? Yeah, so it's some of the stuff that I mentioned uh, above. And if you don't want to take it all that seriously, you can just tell the story of a dungeon that is, you know, uh, munching on the the bodies of adventurers as they, you know, seek uh, fame and glory. Uh, It also can very easily be read as uh, a queer story because there is a lot of monstrosity in how queerness is portrayed and a lot of uh, famous villains throughout, you know, historical portrayals. Uh, Frankenstein's monster, Ursula the Sea Witch from from Little Mermaid are queer coded. And so it it is very uh, potentially empowering to be uh, embodying the the thing that is dangerous and enticing and alluring. And when the uh, people who come expecting to exploit it and, and take from it are, are left uh, dead or beaten or broken or psychologically uh, damaged beyond repair. Wow. That's a powerful feeling, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, not, not that like in the real world, you necessarily want to hurt people like that, but the empowerment of queer people is a super important thing to me. And I think that a lot of mainstream narratives of what it means to be queer fall short of the mark. So if mm-hmm. you can, if you can be uh, monstrous and queer and uh, make people ask questions again about what it means to be safe, what it means to be normal, 
fantastic. You're 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 doing a great job. I think there's mm-hmm. something to be said for the amount of like catharsis something like that gives too, though, because you think about like even like D and D. Yeah, you know, it's like even though you are adventurers and often you think you're the good guys and all that kind of stuff. Sometimes you're like, I just want to fight monsters because it is cathartic to just be up against something Mm -hmm. and to kill it, you know? Yep. Yeah. And, and the catharsis in this game exists in the inevitability of your existence as the dungeon, Mm -hmm. right? The, the dungeon is ever present. It is eternal. It sits there crouched on the hillside or occupying the destroyed church or at the, at the bottom of a ravine it is nearby the town or settlement or whatever. It's nearby civilization where these people come from to to do their explorations. And at no point in time during this game is there ever a single chance that the dungeon is going to be defeated by mm-hmm. the adventurers. It's it, it's not how the game is written. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not possible. You would have to you would have to make your own hack because <laughs> that's not the point. Right. Exactly. So what do characters do in this game? Like, we are not the adventurers in this one. No, uh, you are literally what it says on the tin. Uh, Oh, tell me more. (laughs) I'm confused. This is not what I I thought this game would be. I would like like to subscribe to your newsletter. Uh, So this in this game, you simply exist as this unfolding menace to the people who 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 explore you mm-hmm. right it the the whole thing happens iteratively like we'll we'll start with uh the beginning of your sort of foundation right and we'll there are two phases and one's where the adventurers come in the other one is the time between adventuring parties and that's how your whole existence is defined and so what you what you do in this game is you entice people into your space you tempt them with with treasure, with power, with glory. You disabuse most of them of the notion that they're going to leave alive. Mm. And then you give what you said you would give with the hook that they will never, ever forget about the time that they spent within your walls. Mm. It's interesting because uh, the more I think about this, it there's, there's a card game out there, Boss mm-hmm. Monsters, I believe it's called. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is, it's competitive where you each are building your own dungeon, so to speak, with a boss at the end mm-hmm. of it. And then adventurers just come in and you're, you're, the whole point of the game is to prevent the adventurers from defeating your boss. So you mm-hmm. tempt them with treasure, you tempt them with like all these other side things and, and traps and all that sort of stuff. Um, it, it's interesting, uh, to see this in, like a, a role playing space, especially like uh, the solo uh, RPG space. Um, so, and I know there's a lot that's unique about this game. Uh, but why why did you go the solo RPG route with it? The the pat and easy answers for that are we're in the middle of of a pandemic, and you can't as easily get together and play games with other people. Mm-hmm. So why not have something that you can do on your own? And there have been. There's been a proliferation of solo games yeah, all, through, was... all, all through 2020 and 2021. Beyond just those reasons, though, I think that when you start with the basis of a solo game, you can very easily modify it to include input from more than mm. one person. Yeah. Like we are going to play this game as a trio, right? right? We are we are all going to be the dungeon, but it doesn't default to that. And if you wanted to take a more traditional role playing game and you start paring down how many people are playing, right, you quickly run into problems where you're like, well, I can't play this without two other people. Mm -hmm. I can't I I can't do this with just one other person. That's fascinating. I didn't even think about it like that. Unless the game. Yeah. And and, and these are not thoughts that I've necessarily had before. They're sort of like coming to me right now (laughs) as I'm thinking about it. But like. Cthulhu Confidential uh, from Pelgrain, the gumshoe one, one V one thing like that's made for ostensibly one game master and one player. Mm-hmm. But if you try to play D and D or Pathfinder with one player and one GM, it throws the math of like combat mm-hmm. encounters off. Yeah. Right. Um, imagine trying to play one person apocalypse world. 
right? You're rapidly going to be looking at needing to play mm-hmm. multiple characters as the player or sharing character control with the, with the MC. Mm-hmm. So this kind of game though can easily, I mean, and, and it takes literally no effort can be played with as basically as many people as you want to, as long as the signal to noise ratio doesn't get too high yeah. because you're just asking questions mm-hmm. and answering questions and then telling the stories of what happened to these adventurers when they're walking through the dungeon. Yeah. So it's effectively collaborative world building at that point, right? Oh, the gasp. And you wonder how it ties into my previous work. <laughs> and you wonder why you're on our show. No, no. <laughs> a hum, a hum. Uh, no, but but for real, the the thing that is the hallmark of the stuff that I do, I think, is that when you're playing in a game that I've written, you and whoever's running it or facilitating it or whatever, you're all working together to build this space that you're going to tell a story within. Mm-hmm. Because I think that that enhances player buy-in. I think it makes it a lot easier to be, to feel empowered and to go and do the story things that you do if you are, have some stake in what's happening. And so this game is a reflection of that, right? You're, you're making this space in, in a fictional fantasy setting with not too many parameters or boundaries, but as you play like through multiple cycles, layer upon layer you're creating a reality and constraints for what future cycles will hold Mm. because say uh the same event comes up in a later uh you know a later run through well if it's you know a, a a bloody glowing dagger is hanging before your head like if that happened before is it the same dagger right these questions start spiraling out of your own head mm-hmm. it's not written into the text the text is very spare there's there's not a ton going on in this game in in the written text of the mm-hmm. game but it prompts you to think about this stuff and to really dive in and the tone with which I wrote it, I think, implies that you get to do more with the game than the game necessarily explicitly says you get to do with mm-hmm. it. And that was part of the point. Like, I didn't want to have include a line that said, oh, by the way, if you come up with side stories, feel free to write those down. That's like that makes me as a player go, eh, OK, I guess I could do that. Yeah. But if you if you're reading evocatively written instructional text and it prompts you to think in that mode and you're like, oh, this thing has happened and you start like wondering at the implications of those things, suddenly you're generating fan fiction for your own setting that you're building while you're playing the game. And I know that there are rules as written players, um, but I think that even those kind of people tend to sort of like snowball outside of what the lines are like there's there's a difference between saying Mm -hmm. like here is the rule and i need to follow it versus like i want to do more than that and i know very few people who play games who don't like start to build on those things exactly and the the setup of this i think encourages you to do that because i tried to write the questions in such a way that they that the answers automatically prompt more mm. questions. Mm. And even if you're the kind of person who's just like, well, no, I just have to answer the questions. This is a worksheet that I'm doing. By the time you get through certain sort of goalposts of the play experience, you're going to find yourself asking those questions, asking additional stuff mm-hmm. because connections just start narratively forming as you are building the context within which you're operating. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the history of this game, it's, it's not been around for Mm -hmm. very long. Um, cause we just talked a little bit about like that whole pandemic gameplay and solo gameplay. Mm -hmm. What sparked this game? Why were you like, this is it. I'm going to do it. (laughs) So, uh, back in November of 2020, I scheduled a, uh, a consultation meeting uh, with one Jeff Stormer. Mm. Oh, Hey, Uh, I've heard of him. Friend of the show, yeah. Jeff Stormer, uh, because in in his daily life, Jeff is uh, works in marketing. And I, I, as we had discussed about before we uh, started recording, I have a difficult time sometimes knowing what about myself to market or how to try and get people to buy the games or, or whatever mm-hmm. it is. So uh, not to turn this into a marketing cast, but the context is important. Jeff introduced me to the concept of the marketing funnel. 
right? right? Which is like a four step thing where you let people know about your thing, right? Mm -hmm. People get engaged with the idea of your thing. That's the next level down. People buy the thing that, that they have then engaged with. And then the people who have bought the thing go and tell people about the thing they bought and the cycle starts over again, right? <laughs> you can probably already see some of the like stuff from the game as you've read the text, like baked into that. Because mm -hmm. the idea of the funnel, like the, the first step is really broad and then the second step is narrower. The third step is narrower still and the fourth step is the, the bottom of the funnel. Uh, but it all sends stuff back up. So the next time your space at the top is is wider, right? You're capturing more eyeballs, more attention, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. People are already like, so, I've bought a Tracy Barnett game. Exactly. <laughs> so I I had this meeting with Jeff and I got really inspired and I try, was trying to think of a metaphor for how to talk about this stuff because in case you haven't figured it out by listening thus far, I'm a verbal processor. I like to talk through things to be able to understand them. And so I wrote a Twitter th thread about how to do this marketing thing as if you are the dungeon, mm. right? And the idea is that dungeons in fantasy contexts are these these hulking, looming things that sit on the horizon and they draw people in, right? Stories of the of the glory and the wealth and the riches and so on and so forth that you can get are told in taverns and they're they're talked about in hushed whispers and 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 so on. And the idea from a marketing standpoint is that you bring people in and they they come in for what they think there are their own reasons and then they get entranced by the things that you do and they're left ever changed by the entire process and they go back out and they tell stories of the dungeon and another generation of people are like well that person couldn't do it but i sure can and they go back to the dungeon right and it's the marketing funnel it's it's just a loop that you can keep feeding oh in. it's marketing and funnel as, the game <laughs> um it, the the original thread definitely was and this is the outgrowth of it as purely just a game, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There's no marketing lingo. I don't talk about the funnel and the text no. or anything like that. <laughs> but that was the genesis of it, is the idea that there is this thing that keeps enticing and inviting and altering the people that engage with it. And then they those people go back out into the world and tell their stories. And that brings more people in. Because that's it's a really good story trope, right? Mm -hmm. Every time there's a, it's it, it's like Chekhov's dungeon, right? <laughs> if you mention it in the first act, by the third act, they'd better be exploring yeah. it, you know. So, uh, I I wrote the game from that from that context, and it, like, I wrote the game in, probably uh, other than the tables, like I had the structure of play done in like an hour and a half, mm -hmm. like it just because the thread was fresh in my mind, the concepts were all just like you know, like words of fire in my brain. And I was just like, yeah, here, here's how you do the thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then it took a little bit more to like flesh out the, there's a table of adventurers. We're going to use tarot cards uh, for that. And there are events that happen to the adventurers. So I had to write like random tables. So that took a little bit more like fine grained uh, work. But the whole thing basically just came really quickly as an outgrowth of that original meeting with Jeff. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. Yeah. Since then though, you've been doing kind of like ongoing twitter threads too haven't you that have like polls and like a little bit so i i did a playthrough of it on twitter um and the main thing that i've been doing and this is very much a marketing thing is i found a formula for how to write a tweet about this game that delivers the tone and the content of it really really well mm -hmm. And I've I've been tweeting those a lot and you can expect to see a a modified version of those uh, coming out of my Twitter feed within the next. Well, by the time this airs, they'll be happening right now. So uh, because I am in the process of writing uh, a sequel slash companion game mm -hmm. to You Are the Dungeon, I'm, I'm going to save talking about that until the until the breakdown afterward. But the, that method of marketing of. Basically, I, I situate people within the actual context and I say, uh, you are this and you are that, you know, you are the you are the brooding evil that rests upon the hill that overlooks the, the, the valley town. They venture forth to you seeking glory, seeking wealth, seeking riches, but they are wrong. They leave forever scarred by their existence within your walls. You are the dungeon. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's the formula, right, is. 
situate you as the thing, the, the big enticing thing, situate them as antagonistic or foolish to, to mess with you, mm-hmm. and then hit that you are the dungeon and then link to the game. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I find it funny for the all of our conversation uh, early on about I'm not sure how to market myself <laughs> that I found a really good way to market this one game <laughs> <laughs> because it came out of a marketing conversation. Yeah, that's, no, that's fascinating to me though. That yeah. like that's I all of the places that like you would think now what are we like oh, three years into doing this or something mm-hmm. um, that by this point it wouldn't shock me when people tell me like where their ideas came from but like i'm still like are you sh- are you sure like <laughs> that's <laughs> that's where games come from because that is not why can't i make them then <laughs> <laughs> well i think i think this is a thing that happens to a lot of people who choose to design a game is that there's a lot of that thinking ahead of time. And I think we talked about this the last time I was on the show. And I told you, Amelia, that you are not far away from designing your first game. And you went, oh, no, 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 I'm not. Okay, That's so not here's thing the I'm thing, though, is that I am working on one. It's just we keep kind of getting exactly. stuck on parts of it. And um, <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> but that, But that's fine <laughs> if you're getting stuck. The thing is that I think for most creative people, most people who have a bent towards doing this kind of stuff, it just takes one thing or one set of experiences to flip the switch Mm -hmm. and then suddenly all uh, not not all you're thinking about but there's just an entire part of your brain that is now devoted to how to make a game from things Mm -hmm. right well i I think that like it's and you just start doing that way with podcasts is that like Mm -hmm. you know i've like started or planned or whatever like six or seven different podcasts now at this point because it's like my brain goes oh i know how to do that I have those exactly. tools. I have those pieces. They're in my in my box. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. what is it? When we recorded with Allie and Drew at one point, too, and I was like, the best thing to ever happen to me is that I had an idea for a podcast and then I forgot it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and I think that, like, as no, no matter what your creative discipline is, I think that's that story that you just told for getting the podcast idea is perfect because whether or not it was actual forgetting it was your mind not immediately going okay i guess i have to make this now. right which is totally that's how a level our of, game started yeah. was like somebody being like we could make a game out of this and i was like here's how we would do it and then now we're doing mm-hmm. it and <laughs> it's like done yeah. it <laughs> but as you as you go down the road as you keep doing more creative things your logical brain becomes more judicious about applying the creativity engine (laughs) to a problem. Mm -hmm. So like I've had now plenty of game ideas that I go, Oh, that could be. And as I start to like piece through the concept and mechanics and blah, blah, blah. And and I hit a point where I'm just like, Nope, there's a, there's a, there's a gulf of no, that things have to cross now. And if it reaches like a, a pseudopod across, Nope, and gets to the other side, I go, okay, you're a keeper. Let's yeah. go. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes things just absolutely steamroll across my brain. So there's not even the possibility of a golf, which was what this game yeah. was. <sighs> I just, well, it's so good. It's just so yeah. good. Games are good. Games are good. Right? Yeah. Games are good. Well, before we dive into uh, figuring out what sort of dungeon we are, uh, are there any basic terms and concepts that we need to cover? Not a ton. Uh, this game uses uh, two distinct terms for the phases that happen, uh, and that's really all we need to cover, so I'm going to cover sure. them. Uh, they are uh, Foray, F-O-R-A-Y, and Fallow, uh, F-A-L-L-O-W. And the foray phase is where adventurers come into the dungeon, mm-hmm. right? They, they foray, they, they venture forth and do this thing. And the fallow phase, um, fallow is like when you let a field lie unplanted for a season, right? So it is a season of time where uh, nothing external is coming into the dungeon uh, explicitly in terms of antagonistic force. Mm-hmm. And the dungeon is allowed to grow and expand. Uh, beyond that, I mean, if you know uh, the nomenclature of D number for dice, mm-hmm. right? You'll, it'll, I say D10 in there a few different times. Uh, I reference uh, tarot cards as an extant thing in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is all basic stuff, right? But I mean, to answer the question explicitly, 
that's what you need. Yeah. Uh, you you need to be comfortable with the concept of inscribing glyphs with a a writing utensil or in a digital medium that can then be uh, read and understood by another human being. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to write. There you go. Um, Or if you are uh, unable to, if if physically writing something is not a possibility for you, then you could easily uh, have the questions read to you and you could, in an audio medium, you could uh, transcribe your answers. Mm -hmm. The only thing that you're not going to be able to do easily at that point in time is to draw the the confines of the dungeon itself. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the most succinct answers uh, to that particular line of questioning. It's a really short yeah. game, right? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Actually. Uh, well, I, I would normally say, uh, shall we make some people? Uh, but I, I guess, shall we make a place? Let's make a place. Let's make a place. Let's make a place. Shall we make a dungeon? We shall. Let's make a dungeon. Okay. And I figure we'll go through just one one series of this because that will easily show what what this can do okay. um and we won't take a, a ton of time to play it because you know we've been digressing a lot and i, I want to make sure ryan's not editing for hours that's and hours true. Oh, that's so, the you're part so I much love nicer the most, than i am so it's Is fine. okay fantastic yeah. i love editing okay well then well then we'll go for a long yes. we'll, we're going to do 20 it, rounds of this i, just I can tell you let's like not go. i need to 20, unpack. 20 <laughs> rounds right <laughs> let's do okay. 21 coward <laughs> I love how I love how sassy you've gotten, Ryan. I, oh I love God. that after making after making your first villain, you found sassy Ryan, and he just com- comes out sometimes. It's amazing. Oh my gosh! After Dirge Stranglethorn, it was all downhill. <laughs> it's true. Oh God! All right. So for the beginning, uh, the the procedure of the game is this. Uh, we describe foray and fallow. Um, actually, I'm just gonna I, I, I've read. Uh, I'm just gonna read the procedure because it's not that long. So, to begin, you must know where you started. Turn to page two of this document. Print the page or scribe upon it digitally. Answer the questions on the page. Then use the grid to b- below to below the questions to define your boundaries. This will not be the only such definition. As years turn to centuries and centuries to eons, you will grow, change, and become more. Your existence is defined by times of foray and fallow. Forays are when people explore your unhallowed depths, leaving with more than they ever planned. During fallow times, your vile call attracts new inhabitants, expands your boundaries, and allows you to bring into being new profanities. After the story of your beginning, alternate between forays and fallows to tell your story. Follow the instructions on each sheet, describing who ventures through your blasphemies, what twisted abominations reside within and expand your walls, what curses lurk and leave. Your story is as long as you wish it to be. It can be explored one page after another, or can fester and putrefy between sessions of scribing. Make known of yourself only what you wish. Nothing more and nothing less. I like that. I had a whole mood in my head when I wrote <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> you're like, what's the, are you doing okay? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the page two of the document is the beginning okay. and it's just a series of questions with a grid below it. So we will answer these questions together. We have the shared space over here on the, uh, Google slide to, uh, put down our answers. Um, whoever has the quietest keyboard can do the typing. <laughs> I've got the, probably the fanciest mic, uh, that completely eliminates my typing. Fantastic. Then, uh, Ryan, you are going to be our official scribe. I'll be the scribe. Uh, So the first question is very simple. Uh, What was your original form? Suggestions are a warehouse, barracks, a castle, a temple, etc. I want to do something weird. I was thinking that too. I was like, not some, you know, like, I I don't want underground. No. Um, What is... So when you when you say weird, and this is for either of you, what kind of landscape comes to mind when you say weird? Like what, what sensory impressions do you get? Like um, my, my thought is something extraordinarily non-traditional to the fantasy dungeon type, like totally outside the box sort of deal. Okay. Um, what about like this, Descent Ryan? into Midnight weird. Right. Okay. So speaking I, of that, what about I had a like an that's old dead coral going. reef? Okay. Is it still underwater? Ooh, that's an even better question. I would say... Yes. 
Okay, yeah. so a desiccated submerged coral reef. Are you okay with that, Ryan? Yeah, I think that I think that okay. should be fine. Okay, we can always kind of you know finagle with it as we go if we need to. I right, find we start somewhere and then I am spelling words incorrectly. I got you. Don't worry. Oh lord. There we go. A desiccated submerged coral reef. Question two: Who was responsible for your creation? Suggestions are a landowner, a high priest, a royal consort, arch wizard, so on and so forth. The Kraken. Oh. The Kraken. Cool. Capital T, capital K. Mm. So mode it be. I want to say capital A, capital K. Uh, a Kraken. Okay. Implying that there's more than one. Oh. See, okay, you, you are already tapping into the world building aspect of this. <laughs> of this. Seriously, like that's... It, it, it starts that quickly. Nice. Gosh, I really loved this game. Um, and you will hear some fantastic stuff that we do with this uh, next episode. But it's it's really cool that we're actually getting the chance to play it a little bit. Uh, which, which doesn't actually happen all that often on the show here. Um, I know... I promised Amelia would be back, but things have been quite busy for me this weekend and probably for her. And we have not been able to touch base on actually recording the cold open today or this call to action. So uh, having said all of that, uh, just some reminders. Um, you can check out my A Tale of Twinkle and Awe campaign using Chimera uh, this coming Friday at 7.30 p.m. Central at twitch.chimera.games. Um, also, we have a couple reviews in our pocket right now. Uh, we're still waiting for being able to record with Amelia before we actually dive into reading those, but we absolutely would love a few more. If you could throw a shout out uh, to us on Podchaser, on uh, Apple Podcasts, on Stitcher, any of those things uh, always helps us out in the rankings and really helps others find the show and expands our audience. And the more people that listen, the bigger community that we have, and the bigger community that we have, the more cool things that we can do together. So uh, go ahead and leave a review if you haven't yet. If you have, uh, just feel free to retweet our stuff that we uh, post or even just say, hey, I'm listening to Character Creation Cast and it's great um, on Twitter or wherever. And we would be uh, super thrilled to hear people talking about the show. Uh, and that's free as well. So uh, if you want to help us out, leave a review or just chat about us to your friends. I don't think I have anything else to say for tonight. It's getting late. I still have to finish the edit. So hopefully I'll get this out in time. If not, thank you for your patience. And we will see you next time. Thank you for joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. 
If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. We gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit OneShotPodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like Neo Scum. Neo Scum is a narrative comedy podcast featuring five Chicago improvisers antagonizing their way through the role playing classic Shadowrun. It follows a group of misfits and outsiders. Z, the acerbic cyber troublemaker. Pox, the candy junkie klepto from across the pond. Tech Wizard, the public access actor with a petulant thirst for adventure. And Dak Rambo, the nastiest trucker this side of the Robo Mason Dixon. Join the irascible Neo Scum crew on a puerile rockin' road trip through a weirdo world of tomorrow, doling out street justice to every deeb they encounter, whether they deserve it or not.